Welcome, welcome to our alumni talk, The Future Belongs to Africa. I am delighted that you are joining us here, either in the event studio of Radio Bremen or via your, our live stream. If you speak English, you can switch to our live stream and listen to the English interpretation. Today, we are holding the second round of discussions as part of the series Just Change the World, a series of talks to which the University of Bremen and its alumni association have invited on the occasion of the university's 50th anniversary. I myself studied at the University of Bremen as well, and I'm an elective member of the Alumni Association. And together with the university, we have very consciously decided to give this evening the title, The Future Belongs to Africa. A good 10 years ago, mobile money was introduced to Kenya, enabling money transfers from cell phone to cell phone. This system is now used by zillions of people in Africa who previously had no access to banks or the money economy. For the past three years, such complete solutions have also been offered by telephone companies in France. This is an attempt, attempt to conquer a modern European market with an innovation that originated in Africa. Urban Africa long since became part of the global knowledge society. According to analysis of the future institutes. However, such sometimes rapid developments are oftentimes large, have largely remained under the radar of our media. Today, we would like to talk about where this continent is going. What do modernity and modernization mean in this context? How much is our concept of modernization influenced by colonialist patterns of thinking? We wish to talk about decolonization, about Namibia, and what the University of Bremen has to do with it. As you can see, the agenda is packed and exciting. So without further ado, I wish to extend a very warm welcome to our um, talk. I'm particularly delighted that Rosanna Mart has joined us from South Africa. Rosanna Mart, you were born in District 6, the old slave quarter of Cape Town. You, ha you served as a director of the Center for Critical Research on Race and Ethnic a race and identity, a research center that provided opportunities to examine and explore questions of identity. You are trained in black consciousness, psychoanalysis and political philosophy, and you have written poetry, short stories, and a novel, for which we, you have been awarded prizes. So you received two Lifetime Achievement Awards, one from the Political Born of Struggle and another one of the Nicolas Guillain Baptiste Award from the Caribbean Philosophical Association for your contribution to literature and philosophy. And you are a research ambassador to the University of Bremen. And that is also the reason why you are with us today. A very warm welcome to you. Ms. Mart, so you are from Cape Town, you are from District 6. It's a very famous, uh, well, notorious uh, district. It used to be the old slave quarter of the town of Cape Town. And in the last century, it was a really vivid, active quarter where a lot of um, artists uh, lived. And then um, during the times of the apartheid regime, they decided that this should become a white quarter and people had to were displaced. So you also had forcibly been displaced along with your family. So how did this affect you? Thank you. Good evening. Ja, vielen Dank und einen schönen Abend. Und vielen Dank, dass Sie mir die Gelegenheit geben, diesen Moment in meiner Geschichte hier in Bremen mit Ihnen zu teilen. Ja, also der Distrikt 6 war die sechste Gemeinde von Cape Town. Also das war zu dem Zeitpunkt, als die Sklaverei in Cape Town abgeschafft wurde, so um 1860 herum, würde ich sagen. Und für diejenigen unter den Zuhörern und auch auch den Zuschauern dort draußen, ist es ja so, als die äh, Niederländer, äh, Bangalen, äh, Mauritius, Indonesien und so äh, wirklich kolonisiert haben, haben sie eben versklavte Menschen aus diesen Kolonien nach, äh, zum Kap gebracht. Und äh, mütterlicher Seite bin ich aus dem hindu-bengalischen Seite und von der Vaterseite aus dem Eastern Cape. Also das bedeutet, dass ich meinen Nachnamen habe und mein Nachname ist 
ist Mart und Mart steht für den dritten Monat des Jahres, März. Also das ist noch Teil der Kolonialisierung. Das heißt, die Niederländer haben einen eben versklavt und dann bekam man einfach die Nachbarn und mein Großvater war eben der Wir können nicht weg von dieser Geschichte, es ist da. Also just in terms of your, your, your question, yes, I think because District 6 became this important hub of political activism, a lot of our political leaders from, I mean, before the 1950s came from the District 6 region, of course, music, art, culture, and I think this is what happens when you have a regime that tries to repress um, the oppressed peoples of South Africa, and of course, by 1960, when they had the Group Areas Act and then these forced removal acts, um, they absolutely made sure that that previously enslaved community um, were forcibly removed. So I'm part of, of that community that went through that forced removal. And of course, you have like places like Sophia Town and also um, Harfield. I mean, there are lots of these pockets in South Africa where people were forcibly removed because the apartheid government decided to declare that particular area a white area. So that's, that's a little bit of the history of, of District 6. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we will uh, maybe have an opportunity to, uh, to talk about that at a later point in time as well. Now I'd like to welcome our next guest, Uchi Eid. You're president of the German Africa Foundation, a nonpartisan foundation that primarily operates in the parliamentary sphere. It is committed to implementing the German government's Africa guidelines and to fostering deeper relations between African countries and Germany. For quite some time, you chaired a committee at the United Nations nations that consulted the UN Secretary General on water and basic sanitation. And with interruptions, uh, you were a member of the Bundestag for the Greens for 17 years and in Gerhard Schröder's red-green government, you were Parliamentary State Secretary in the Federal Ministry of Development Cooperation for seven years. So your lifetime is devoted to politics with um, Africa and Africa has always played a prominent role in it. So thank you very much for joining. Frau Eid, als Sie jetzt in diesen Tagen die neue Regierung gebildet haben, Ms. Eid, now that the um, new government is um, being formed in Berlin, did it not excite you? Did it not feel tempted to join? Well, I always feel this itch when we're talking about politics and South politics. And Africa is just in front of our door. It's only 14 kilometers away from the European continent. And we, when I talk about we, we are a number of activists and people who in recent years have dealt intensively with Africa. And we obviously try to raise our voice, but I have to tell you immediately what I read in the coalition contract about Africa is not really making me enthusiastic. I would have wished for more courage, for more, um, how shall I put it, future vision, visions and ideas for the future. And I've got more of a feeling, well, I think that we are still thinking along the old lines. This is what I saw. So I'm quite disappointed to just state this at the beginning. So that's a good opening statement. We will talk and come back to that later on. We will talk, come back about uh, our expectations to the new German government. Manfred Hintz, you, ha you are joining us from uh, Neunkirchen, close to Zoom. And you are 85 years old. We can check that on Wikipedia, so I'm not sharing a secret here. And due to the pandemic situation, you decided for yourself, for your health, that it is better for you and safer if you remain at home and join us online. You were appointed professor for public law in 1971, the founding year of the University of Bremen. And as a scholar of international law, you have provided guidance and support to Namibia's independence process at the United Nations since the mid-1970s. You founded the Namibia Project at the University of Bremen, which rewrote history for the textbooks of independent Namibia. After the country's independence, you helped establish the Faculty of Law at the University of Windhoek, and you served as its dean for many years. And you were also an advisor to President Sam Nujuma. Welcome. Welcome. 
Manfred Hinz, so uh, you lived in Namibia for a very long time. What is so fascinating for you about this country? Well, before I speak about why Namibia fascinates me, I wish to thank you most warmly for inviting me, for giving me the opportunity to take part today. And due to the present situation, the pandemic situation, um, unfortunately, I have to join online. So, Namibia, why does it fascinate me? Well, it didn't start with a personal fascination. I was rather moved at the beginning. I was moved 50 years ago when, together with the University of Bremen, we started to focus on the shift, shift in society and to deal with the colonization of Namibia as well. And to me, the step was logical to really start something in Namibia to deal with the legacy of decolonization, legacy of colonization of Namibia and Southern Africa. And I really wanted to make a contribution. I became fascinated about the country at a later point in time. Um, my visits to Namibia really fascinated me. I lived in Namibia for a long time, and I mean, I visited almost every single corner of the country, and I experienced and witnessed the beauty of this country, and I came to know the wonderful people, and I really respect and love them. It's a huge country. It's two and a half times the size of Germany, but only has a population of just under two and a half million. Until the First World War, the country was the German colony of German Southwest um, Africa. So what really made you start working in Namibia? Well, I started already to point to that. Bremen has played a fundamental role in the colonization of this country. It was a merchant from Bremen who really triggered this whole movement, who triggered the colonization of this country. And first, people try to um, use it for commercial purposes, but then it became a colony. And that is part of the history, part of the history of Bremen. So it was really at hand to focus on it and to deal with this chapter of history and to learn with it, to draw conclusions for the future as well. And what did you do exactly in the 1970s? Well, you already mentioned this. It was the year 1975, so four years after the University of Bremen was founded, that the, we had a campaign in Germany, a campaign on Namibia by the large German um, churches and the head of the um, SWAPO, Bena Martina, um, who was stationed not in uh, Germany but in Scandinavia. And he toured Europe and he also came to visit Bremen and he gave a uh, presentation in the Stefani Church here in Bremen. He talked about his country and he called on people to help Namibia. All countries help us except for one country who should rather play a prominent role here, and that was Germany. And back then we were about two, three or five people. Among those was the rector of the University of Bremen, the rector of the uh, Übersee Museum here in Bremen, of the, German, of the State Archive here in Bremen. And we decided to respond to this call. We decided that we should do something, something new that was totally different from what had done before. So we sat down together with a representative of of swap when we ask them, what can we do? Of course, we cannot um, send weapons. That is not our objective. But we, there might be other areas where we can help to bridge differences to make our contribution for a free Namibia. And he told us, yes, the answer is clear. Indeed, you can help us. You can make a contribution. We have schools, exile schools in Angola and Zambia and in other African countries. 
So we have schools in these countries where our children need textbooks. We don't want to wish the textbook that the South Africans had at that time because they reflected apartheid and the thinking way of thinking of the apartheid regime. So that was actually where we stepped in. We started developing textbooks, correcting the different positions. So that would be my next question. Um, it became a project, the Namibia project of the University of Namibia. Who was the one deciding on the content of the new textbooks? Well, right from the start, it was clear that it should not be us to formulate the content. We wanted to do it in cooperation with our partners in Namibia. And we were lucky in unserem Projekt um, to have someone in our project, a former teacher, and he was a teacher in one of the exile schools in Angola. He is now the um, deputy um, um, the minister of Angola. So we sat down, we wrote and drafted text, he drafted text, we looked at those drafts, and it was a process of, of mutual and continuous cooperation and exchange. It was important that we did not um, orient ourselves or our project on the school books that were already available in Namibia. It was not, we were not on a one-way track, it was a mutual process, so in parallel to this first textbook that was dealing with the um, history of Namibia, we also started drafting a textbook for our schools here in Germany, so the textbook um, Namibia which we drafted, was also used here in Bremen. And you were supported by the University of Bremen, right? Yes, and that fits in very well with our topic tonight, just change the world. But back then, it, I mean, it was something very unusual because the SWAPO was regarded, especially in Germany, by many people as a terrorist organization. And during those times, we experienced here in Germany the terror of the RAF. Were you facing well, hostilities in a way? Yes. Yes. But we try to circumvent these um, well, people with these with these thinking. So we did not want to take as a first uh, cooperation partner the SWAPO, and uh, we decided to co cooperate with. Um, um, someone from Osaka. And we, we work with that Namibia Institute in that country. And SWAPO played um, a secondary role in the early stage of a project. So we had a lot of discussions. And oftentimes people, I mean, said that we are cooperating with terrorists. And a, germ, a, well, a newspaper here from Bremen published an article about me and my the people I work with, and they labeled us as terrorists. But I mean, it didn't really touch us. It didn't affect us. But there were hostilities, and we managed to deal with them also thanks to the broad support that we received in Bremen um, from the university, from my department, but also the um, government of Bremen. So, Ms. Mart, decolonization has become a focal point of your work. You previously or you just published a book on it. 
and uh, you also offer a course at the Summer Academy at the Southern, well, at the at University in South Africa, and it is also a distant learning university. It's one of the largest universities. It's one of the largest worldwide with over 300 um, students. And I know that you have a very um, pointed view on decolonization. When it comes to the decolonization from Bremen, I mean, Bremen has played a prominent part in the colonization of Southern Africa. And this, um, I mean, this uh, decolonization was not mainly triggered by inhabitants from Bremen, even though they played a prominent part in the colonization of Namibia. Okay, um, thank you. Well, let me just say this much. Um, one of the things about, you know, teaching and being part of um, a small group of people annually who did the decolonial summer school at the University of South Africa, otherwise known as UNISA, was, um, you know, getting the group who was involved, students, staff, international scholars, to make a contribution to decoloniality and decolonial education. Um, and we had one basic fundamental rule, and that is for scholars and students to tell the truth. So I don't think we can be here tonight and, and sort of not talk about some of the factual information that is necessary to understand not only South Africa and Namibia, but the whole sort of relationship that I think Germany has with the African continent. So let's just start by a few things, and this is not directed at uh, Professor Hinz at all. Um, this is just trying to fill in some of the gaps because I think it's crucial um, you know, so we have a situation here, as described, where uh, a German professor from the University of Bremen, you know, goes to Namibia and there's a good relationship and, you know, um, there's a relationship in terms of textbooks and also drawing up the constitution. Um, and the fact that there's only two and a half million people in Namibia. Now, that is not a coincidence. I mean, the fact is that the Second Reich killed millions of Nama and Herero people. So we can't overlook that, we can't brush over it, we can't pretend that it isn't part of a very painful history. Um, when I do philosophy born of struggle, philosophy born of massacres, it talks about the philosophical you know, components of understanding your existential position from your position of struggle, right? I came dressed like this tonight because I didn't want to wear any of my ethnic dresses because I want to make a point that Africans come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, there are 54 countries on the African continent and we can't neglect to talk about the fact that Namibia has two and a half million people because millions of Naman Herero people were massacred, killed, starved between 1902 and 1906. So, so I just want to say that. Secondly, the fact that Namibia, you know, as a country in Africa, would have to rely on a German professor, no disrespect to the insurmountable knowledge and experience and expertise that Professor Hinz has is because part of colonization is to make sure that the colonized speak in the language of the colonizer. Um, I speak many different languages. I don't know what my grandmother's language was when she was colonized and brought as cargo, human cargo, as part of the enslaved to the Cape. But I also speak Kap, a derivative of Dutch, which is what the Bengali and Javanese and Indonesian uh, people spoke when they were brought to the Cape. So what I want to say is, um, you know, that in this climate where German research councils and foundations are all involved with trying to make sure that we approach this decoloniality and this, which is a process, but it's, it's, it's for us, for me and the students and people that I work with, it isn't just one within the university, it is also one of activism, it is one of in the streets, in your home, where you live and where you work. So just coming back to this whole notion 
that, you know, we have to have people from outside of the country write our constitutions or be our professors. I mean, that is because the cruelty, the history of cruelty and colonization was so intense that it is still hard today for black professors in South Africa, um, you know, who have only now, how many years are we, like 27 years, post the first democratic elections, reach the level of being professors. Because part of the severity and intensity of colonization is to not only make sure that the colonized speak the language of the colonizer, but that you do not educate the colonized. And if you do, you colonize, you, you educate them to serve the master. So I just want to be clear in my position here tonight, um, whilst being mindful and regarding other people's position and other people's histories and knowledges and expertise, that colonization isn't something that, you know, we can just undo automatically because it's so embedded in the fabric of how people exist on the African continent. I've been to several places on the African continent, but I want to just say that, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the fact that we had roads must fall, King George must fall, as part of the process of, of students taking action, not wanting to be in a university where they have to look at these statues of people who colonized us. It's like when we had Jan van Riebeek's day, we were given the day off from school to say, oh, let's go and celebrate how your colonizer colonized you. I mean, the process of decolonization in South Africa is happening at every possible level. Um, when students say, we don't want to be taught this, we want to be taught things that are, are our history. We want to have rule of law that was instrumental to how we live today, that's drawn up by us. So, and you're saying that colonization still plays a prominent role also in um, research processes, well, of today, right? So, so, Mr. Hinz, were these questions that you also discussed as part of your project? Yes, of course, of course. It has always been an important uh, subject for us, and um, it has also been, or it was during the 20 years that I lived in Namibia, uh, an issue I focused on. When I came to Namibia, I had a hard time or I didn't expect that I would live in that country for 20 years. But I made friends. I had friends at the University of Namibia, black friends at the University of Namibia. And I had friends in the um, government of Namibia at that time. And they convinced me to stay in the country. And they convinced me to uh, work at the university. It was, well, not my objective to start working at the university once uh, when I moved to Namibia. It was the rector of the University of Namibia who called me into his office one day and he asked me whether I would like to participate in the founding of the um, Faculty of Law and together with a colleague and I think I can call him friend now, Professor Krambach, I started working towards this goal. And it has always been clear for me and Ms. Mart, what Ms. Mart has just elaborated on. It. And she really stresses um, the root causes of colonization. And she is absolutely 100% correct. I strongly agree with her here. And that way of thinking has always been an objective of our Namibia project and it has always guided me in my work and I always try to implement it in my practical work. And I am delighted that my rather small faculty in Namibia has grown over the years. It has really grown and it has become a very large faculty. And I think we only have black colleagues working there now. 
And this is a great achievement, a great achievement of history. And I, I mean, I don't want to take credit for this development. It's just, it just shows how history has chosen the right track, and it supports the uh, reasons and the the root causes and consequences that we just heard from Ms. Maud. Miss um, Eid, when we talk about black identity, that identity need to be um, well established, right? So what role can whites play in this process? Well, I would first like to underline two points. I'm here and my sphere of activity is Germany. And then I ask myself, what did we as Germans do in history? And this is exactly the point uh, with Namibia. When we, Green Party, joined the German parliament in 83, it was one of our foci to have Namibia and the recognition and acknowledgement of the genocide in German Southwest Africa. And until today, there is no excuse. Okay, they planned it apparently, but this is embarrassing. This is a shame to me because in the 80s, we already said in the parliament and we asked and required this in all places. And I remember when Namibia became independent, only the foreign minister went to Namibia and not the German chancellor. And there, at the day of independence, to offer an official uh, excuse, I didn't understand it at all. And Cole, the chancellor, then went to Namibia, and he, at the time, refused to accept an official delegation of Herero, and they wanted to hand over a memorandum. And I have to say very openly that CDU, Christian Democrats colleagues, came to me when, in 1994, well, you know that the Green Party had been uh, not in the Bundestag in the parliament from 19 to 94, but I'd been working uh, in West Africa at the time. And then a colleague from the Christian Democrat Party said to me, if you are now the president of the parliamentary group for South Africa and you go to Namibia, you have to do this. This is what you need to do. And the first journey I organized with all the members of parliament, and there was a PDS, that is the left-wing party, they all joined. And the first thing is we went to Namibia and then at the German embassy, we uh, accepted and received an official delegation and each faction of the German parliament excused itself for the genocide that was committed by the Germans. And what I really deplored at the time was that this was not mentioned in any minutes or protocol of the uh, German uh, Ministry of the Exterior because they said if we excuse ourselves in Namibia then there will automatically be claims, claims for reparations. And I didn't understand that at all because to excuse yourself, this is first of all a human and moral duty and I thought this is uh, totally unacceptable what they did. But in Namibia nobody knows about this and I always try to say that we, that is the the political parties at the German parliament have done so and that this, sorry. Well, the genocide committed of the Herero and the Mama in 1904-1905, approximately 70,000 people died. German forced them to the desert, right? And yes, so when they were forced to the desert, they died from thirst. Well, thus, I just wanted to agree to this. So if one speaks about Namibia, then we cannot really uh, forget our history. And Manfred Hinz is not doing this at all. This is very obvious. And I know that the name of Manfred Hinz, uh, and uh, I've known him since I've been member of the German parliament and since I've dealt with Namibia. But you can also make small signs. For example, in Berlin, there is still not a monument that in remembrance to draw this into the acknowledgement and to, into the public about the genocide in Namibia. This is really a scandal. And so I totally agree. There's still a lot that needs to be done.
So it was not until this summer that Germany signed um, a contract for reparations of about 1 billion euros. And some of that money will go to the um, Aero. Of course, you said that there has not been an official apology, but Germany has recognized this as a genocide. So this is a, well, I don't know, a symbol, Miss Mord. Is this enough? What do you expect? What needs to happen in this context? <laughs> well, I think that we also have to talk about intellectual reparations. I mean, there's reparations comes in, in many different forms. I think the financial reparation has always been first and foremost on the agenda for, for, many, for many countries. So let's just examine this a little bit more before I answer you or, or get, offer you a response. So it wasn't just Namibia. Germany had done quite an incredible, remarkable job at colonizing and usurping Africa. Nobody invited them. Nobody invited Germany. It went there completely uninvited, usurped and colonized. Next to Britain and France, Germany was the third uh, biggest European country um, in terms of its capacity for, um, you know, usurping and colonizing African countries. So considering that there are 54 countries, I think you can all do the math. If it was Britain and France, and let's not forget Belgium and what happened in the Congo, you know, you take rubber, you take raw materials, but you don't actually pay for it. And instead, what the Belgians did was murder and kill and massacre people. So, you know, reparations is not simply a question of paying somebody a particular monetary value for the destruction that you had caused to that nation. Reparations has to be a morally and ethical issue, a recognition that you, you not only, I mean, I'm not, I'm not religious at all. Um, so I want to make that clear. I'm not coming to this with the question of forgiveness. I'm coming to this with the question of what is your ethical responsibility. I mean, you had, what's his name? Karl Jaspers, you know, who talked about metaphysical guilt. We know that lots of Germans feel guilty. I mean, I'm not interested in guilt. I'm interested in your agency, in your political responsibility, in your ethical and moral responsibility to the people that you colonized. It is also about an intellectual reparation. For example, you know, part of the project of decolonization is to recognize, like I'm speaking to you in English, right? This is the language of my colonizer. So, so, and you know, I can also speak formal Dutch because all other African languages were outlawed. The law was you receive instruction in English and you receive instruction in what is, was then called Afrikaans. So to have reparations, to think about intellectual reparations is also to think about the construction of knowledge. So for example, when I hear people say 70,000 Nama and Herrera, Herrera people were killed, where I come from, those numbers are much larger. For example, because European countries like to give you numbers to say, oh, we weren't as bad in that country. We were, we were not so bad in, in the Cameroon, but we were terrible in Namibia. So there's a big issue about rewriting history from the position of the colonized, from the position of the massacred, from the position of the oppressed. So that, that in itself. Let me just say something about intellectual reparation. So we are in a place in history where there has been worldwide action, activity, um, activism, Black Lives Matter, um, the decolonial project has become worldwide. And students are saying, we want to know, you know, we want to learn about our history, not from the position of the colonizer. So if you think about, you know, the history of mathematics, the history of algebra in North Africa, um, you know, the history of poetry, the history of spoken word, I mean, the history of philosophy. I mean, at, at university, we get taught German, German philosophy and French philosophy. My PhD is in philosophy. I do not teach in a philosophy fit department in my own university, right? Not in, I mean, only recently, the other, the, the, the second black person, or you can say the first because she's ethnically black in ways. We use political black, ethnically black. We have different expressions for this, right? Um, just three years ago, you know. Yes. 
Well, you said that we have to look through, um, to at all the chapters of colonialism. What does it mean for the scientific process, for the um, reparation payments, for the reconciliation with, with whites who are eager to yeah. cooperate? How can this work? Okay, so, so let me just finish that. So even on an intellectual level, we don't get to learn and examine African philosophy. It is treated as something that is folklore, um, you know, it can never be as important as German or French philosophy. So to fight to have that, I mean, I'm busy with a group of people who are writing an African phenomenology book. Recently, we had the first South African sociology textbook for which I wrote the race chapter. So that's what I'm talking about. It's also the thinking, it's knowledge construction. So if you unearth all the colonial knowledge and recognize that we have knowledge that's indigenous or that has been around for a long time. So you're asking me another question about the role of white can incorporate. Yes, okay. how can cooperation work? Um, gee, this is a very complex question. It's a very complex question because, because I think that I think white people have expectations. First of all, what black people look like, what we sound like, the fact that we're supposed to be grateful. You know, we're supposed to say thank you very much. We're supposed to um, be indebted to our liberators. You know, our, our students. But what about the students? You talk to some students here at the University of Bremen. Yes, How do they yes. react? Okay, so let me tell you. So in South Africa, we have various political movements um, and political parties. And of course, many of my students are either members or support the EFF, the Economic Freedom um, uh, Fighters, Economic Freedom Fighters, yes. And the BLF, which is Black Land First. Um, I don't have that many students who support the ANC and for all kinds of reasons, which I'm not going to go into. So here's the difference. So black South African students have come to know their history past, since the time of Steve Biko. So post-1968, there's been a lot of information, a lot of exchange, a critique. Yes, the, the, one of the founder members of the Black Consciousness Movement of Azania, which is South Africa's name. So, you know, St Steve Biko talks about the role of the white liberal and how white liberals actually thought, you know, let, let, let's, be, let's be in charge of the black movement. Okay, so let me, let me come to that. Well, but I'm talking about German uh, students. Now that you're here in yes. uh, Germany, you, um, yes. you talk to German yes, students. How do they react? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they're not uh, telling you to be thankful. No, no. I think that um, my, my sense of, of, of my relationship, my interaction, my engagement with, with German students is students here are very reserved. They don't express themselves very much. You know, they, they, are, they, they are very reserved. I think learning and engaging and confronting histories of colonization for a lot of the students who are in their 20s and 30s is either one of shame or one of guilt. And as a teacher, I mean, as a professor, I'm still a teacher. As a teacher, I'm not really interested in those expressions. And of course, I can't change the fact that they have them. So what I try to do is bring this perspective of using your agency to learn, to unlearn certain forms of knowledge, but to take the path to learn new forms of knowledge and new forms of, of learning and new forms of being in the world. If, you're, if the only position that white folks can have in the world is that of superiority, is that of oppressor, is that of leader, is that of, you know, hand throwing humanitarian packages to African countries after you massacred and destroyed them, then that is, that is what young German students know. They have that sense of guilt. And being here, like all the workshops and the seminars and my involvement is to say, you know, because they ask, they say things like, you are very cheerful, you laugh a lot. And I'm like, yes, of course, I laugh a lot because I think the world is worth being having a laugh about sometimes. And it's about learning to examine and do self-interrogation and self-examination. What kind of student am I? Am I going to perpetuate this idea of, of knowledge coming from the top down? Or am I going to unlearn 
this whole process of thinking about my position as a European. Part of being a teacher in a university is what I call there's pedagogy of the oppressed and there's pedagogy of the oppressor. So somewhere we have to meet. And where we meet is where we take ethical responsibility, but we also take it as part of our project as, as, as learners and as scholars to recognize that we have to learn other forms of knowledge. So, so students here are very somber, very quiet. Yes, Mit Eitz, where do you see yourself here? What um, motivates you? Are you working from a feeling of guilt or what motivates you? Well, I think I went through a couple of waves, I would call it. I come from a small village where there was no cinema. It was in the Southern Palatinate, which is a poor region and still is a poor region today. And there were missionaries who came at the weekend and they showed us pictures, pictures from their missionary outlets. And to me, as a small child, I was extremely impressed. And at the time, those who are about my age, so beyond 70, they know Albert Schweitzer. They still know who he was. So that was the trigger would call it. And then, when I studied, I had a different interaction with the question, because I asked myself, which countries are still colonized? And then, at the same time, there was the Students' Association, and I was in charge of international questions at the students' body. And there, we massively supported independence movement in Angola and Mozambique, Frelimo, and PLA, and uh, we supported them, and we did events. Okay, and then I joined the German parliament, and there we had to ask the question on a political level, what are we doing in our foreign politics with regard to Africa, and not for, uh, for Africa, but always in collaboration with Africa. And I've been a member for 20 years in Parliament, uh, interrupted by four years where I which I spent in Eritrea. And there I was asked to be in head of a reintegration program for Eritrean refugees who wanted to go back home because the war was over. And the, the APLF, I supported them, the movement for freedom in Eritrea. And again, this is also uh, something what, what became of this EPLF movement. But then I'm somebody who rolls up the sleeves and wants to do something. And then in Eritrea, they said, hey, Ushi, you're a guest here. You can give us your opinion, but decision and doing, this is what we do. And immediately, I, I, I felt, oh, yeah, this is correct, and you have to just stand back. You cannot always be dominant, and I understood this. And then immediately, I was told my limits, which I completely th thought was completely okay. And when I then got back to the parliament in 1994, I then was head of this group of members of parliament. And then I turned or became secretary of state. But for Africa, that was not most important. But I was the personal uh, officer for Africa of the Chancellor Choida. And in that role, I met so many African colleagues, and at the time, something that one didn't accept at all, I was massively attacked by NGOs because we uh, supported the new partnership for development that African politicians had designed. And here everybody said, oh, this is the World Bank and others. And then I said, don't you trust African politicians that they are capable of de creating and designing a strategy for Africa all by themselves? Because it also said, we want to get out of the corner of those who receive developmental aid. And I thought that was completely correct. And though I was a Secretary of State of the Ministry of Economic Collaboration, cooperation, uh, they said, we want to play a role on the international stage. That is us 40, uh, sorry, 54 states, and this is totally correct. And I was supported by the Chancellor Schroeder and the Foreign Minister, Mr. Fischer, and I supported the requirement.
request to reform the United Nations, but not because Germany should be better represented, but the Chancellor Schroeder took me as his ambassador, ambassador into the world to advertise for a reform of the United Nations organization in which the African continent should have, has to have a vote as a constant member, a permanent member, sorry, of the United Nations organization. So you see there are very different personal attitudes that developed within me, and I do not come from this movement of decolonization. To me, this is simply a rational attitude based upon the fact that all humans are equal. And it's a no-go. We cannot be the benefactors, and the other ones are the ones who have to say thank you for all these beneficials. And I never, not even as Secretary of State, ever expected a thank you. I always told my colleagues, because I was also a member of parliament, and. I often met uh, members of parliaments from different African countries, and I always said, say no, please also say no, because Tony Blair and this philosophy of Nepard with African NEPAD politicians and the German NEPAD politicians, he this has been designed that is that you get away from developmental aid and you move towards very normal economic and scientific relations. And Tony Blair at the G8 the summit then came back and focused on this developmental aid. So do you think the the attitude reflects this, and you said that these, well, or the re of the beneficiaries, or well, correct. I would like to add one last point. Sorry, and in the coalition uh, contract or agreement, it's completely wrong to say as if more money in developmental collaboration, as if that would be the path that we should take. It's a completely wrong path. So that's a clear statement, Manfred Hinz. Well, thank you. Well, let me talk about the fact that we it's not about simply giving more money. So, a few minutes we talked and discussed the following. We talked about Namibia, the genocide, and Together with a friend, in the year 2003 and 2004, and in 2004, um, well, that 2004 marked the uh, 100th anniversary of the um, Battle of uh, Waterberg or the Umahakari. Mm. We talked to many people. In, in the country. We wanted to get an idea um, what the Ereiro, the Sam, the Damara think and what they think about the genocide, how they see the genocide, and we wanted to get a feeling what they expect from Germany. And it's simply wrong to believe that the first thing they would mention would be payments. Of course, it has to do with money, it has to do with financial support. Well, support is maybe not the right word, but compensation, of course. It all has to do with compensation. But first and foremost, and we realized that in many interviews, they told us we lost our, de our dignity, we want our dignity back. That was really the core message that we received, that they stated. We heard that in many interviews with them. And we have a um, well. We have signed that contract in June of 2000 and 2001. The contract about the reparation payments. But I personally doubt that these socially diplomat well the social diplomatic contract that was elaborated by a German politician and a representative of the well of Namibia whether this document would really 
um, bring about what the, um, era, the natives hope for, their dignity. So what needs to happen to give them their dignity back? Ms. Eid has already pointed to this. So far, there has not been an official apology by the head of the German state, the German government, um, the former Minister for Economic uh, Cooperation, Heidemar Vitorek Sol, had apologized. But there has not been an official apology by the German Chancellor. And an apology would simply be a first step, a first step of a longer process. The, the, well, the children and children of the children of the um, Herer, Herero, etc. I mean, we need to console with them. It's a mutual process. And one more idea, if you allow. I mean, I'm um, 39 kilometers away from Bremen, but we are in Bremen, and in Bremen we have a erected a small memorial site close to or right next to the colonial elephant. Well, it's not a really colonial monument, it's rather an anti-colonial monument. And we erected this this monument in memory of all the victims of the genocide. And it was erected with stones from Namibia, stones from the Waterberg, from the Omahakari Plateau. And they were transported to Germany as a symbol, a symbol for what um, happened in Namibia. And it should remind us that something like this shall never, ever happen again. So this is a small memorial memorial site. It's nice to have, but in Bremen we also have the um, Lüderitz uh, Street. So Adolf Lüderitz was um, really fostering and promoting decolonization uh, in Namibia. Do you think we have to rename these streets? Well, that is a very difficult debate. Many, many years ago, because Namibia became independent and before the, before the change in South Africa, we started um, a campaign, we financed it with uh, money from the University of Bremen, with uh, money from the Namibia project, and we actually wanted um, to rename the Lüderitzstraße to um, be the Nelson Mandela Street. But um, right-wing extremists opposite well, fought against that idea. So it's a very complicated um, process, and, f and unfortunately, it did not lead to the desired um, outcome. Miss um, I, I think in Berlin, we also have um, Lüderitz, uh, Lüderitz Street, right? No, no, if I remember correctly, it was renamed. But before Miss Eid takes the floor, let me just say one more thing. One more thing to uh, an idea to what or, or uh, to what Miss Martz said. She elaborated on a philosophy, how she deals with a philosophy. It reminds me about my time in Namibia when I studied jurisprudence and I taught jurisprudence in Namibia at the university. And I oftentimes was confronted with the question, what do I or what should I convey to my students? What was the message I should convey to my students? I mean, the large, well, the prominent philosophers from Europe with their teachings, sometimes the teachings are, well, a bit complicated. I don't know, but still you uh, cannot, you, it's just part of the history of philosophy. But what did I do? I also taught about Ubuntu, about the movements in Africa, the, philosoph the ph philosophical movements in Africa. And my students really were fond of that. They really benefited from that. 
And it's important to think about philosophy. And when we think about philosophy, we don't um, only refer to European philosophy. We need to acknowledge what has been developing in the African context. So that was just a, re a remark, but an important remark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Eid, now one question for you. How important, I mean, how important is it to have a discussion like that, to rename streets, etc.? Well, here I've got a slightly different opinion. I think that when you change street names, then you eliminate parts of our history. And I ask myself whether it wouldn't make more sense to have monuments and street names put into a context, contextualize them. So not hide them, but to have a visible explanation at these sites, because then what then allowed to start thinking about this are also teachers who go there with school classes when discussing the topic. I think this would be more worthwhile than just making it disappear from the street level. I uh, participated in a tour of Kreuzberg, a part of Berlin, and there are a lot of these street names that are still there, and I must say, this this uh, tour, well, to put it differently, beforehand I was really in favor of elimination, but then after this guided tour I thought about it and I thought, no, this would not be a good solution. Our society has to be forced also within the city pictures to really to confront this. Okay, so but the colonial monument here in Bremen, I mean, it, it became an anti-colonial um, monument and this a plague was a new monument that was added to the elephant. May I just add one thing? May I just add one? No, no, hold, hold on for a second, because I wish to ask Ms. Maat something. So, Ms. Maat, how should we deal with these colonial monuments or relics in South Africa? Oh, no. I mean, well, unfortunately, we have to keep time in mind. So, Ms. Maat. I mean, students are taking down monuments monuments of well that remind of a coloniz well of apartheid colonization etc what's your opinion on that how should we deal with them should we well get rid of them what's your opinion well i think you know we're talking about two different contexts here um, in the context of south africa 90 percent of the population is black so to have roads at your university um you know looking up at the backdrop of this beautiful mountain as you come and walk up and come from your township, you know, uh, which Chumani, a uh, very interesting guy, I'm not gonna tell you all the history about, you know, what happened there, but within, within a very short time period, that, that statue was removed. So I think for young students living post-94, for all of us, not just as students, living post-94, who wants to live your time in freedom to be reminded of how you were colonized? So the statues have to go, as far as I'm concerned, in South Africa. I can't tell you what to do here. So I just want to also touch up on something um, that Ms. Eit said um, earlier on. So for me, the, the, the whole question of decolonization is not about equality. I don't want to be equal to my master. I mean, I'm better than my master, otherwise I wouldn't be here. I don't want to be equal to, to look for equality with people who oppressed my, 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 my ancestors. So it's, it's, it's the, de the, the process and the project of decoloniality um, first and foremost demands that, you know, the land is returned. And we know that in South Africa there's been small little attempts to do that. I mean, I find it completely perverse when I go to Canada and there's a conference and suddenly we have to pay homage to indigenous people and say, I stand here on Mi'kmaq land. This is lip service. This is lip service. So you want to acknowledge, you know, in this case, um, in the Canadian context, and yet that land has not been returned. So we have to make sure that if we're talking about decolonization, it actually has to mean something for the colonized. It has to be driven 
by the colonized, not by the colonizer. So in terms of, you know, in the South African context, as you all know, settler colonials are still there. They form 10% of the South African population. If you think about how for us to deal with this, we still have white settler colonials in South Africa, heads of departments, deans, uh, you know, and the, the, that, that is slowly changing. But the mindset is still that if you bring in indigenous knowledge, no, this is not going to work. This is a little bit backward. So we have to have, and fortunately, this is run by students, spearheaded by students, that we enter this debate in recognition of knowledge and information and thought and ideas that were kept away from us and make sure that it becomes part of our curriculum. I think the issue in Germany is obviously a different one, as you've outlined. Um, the, the majority of the population uh, is German, and if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that to remove those statues means you're trying to erase history. And so you don't want that history to be erased. You want people to confront that history. I think a younger generation is going to ask for more statues, maybe of people who played a role in, in the liberation um, sort of thinking and ideas like, let's say, Walter, ben Walter Benjamin or Carl Jaspers or Hannah Arendt, and rightfully so. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I don't feel that it's my place to, to, to sort of put forward as to what should happen with statues here. It should come from people who've been involved as activists, as thinkers, also looking at ways to liberate Germany from its the cruelty of its colonial past, not to erase it, but to liberate it and say, we have to develop new ways of thinking about ourselves in the world. So that, that's my position, um, Ms. Eid. Yeah. Well, when we, if we want to talk about the future, and we also want to talk about the future today, I mean, of course, we have to talk about the past. There is still a lot that needs to be changed in the heads and minds of people. It's still a process process that has not yet been concluded. But when we talk about the future, who is the main driver? of change. And in Namibia, we have heard about um, examples from Namibia and South Africa. There are oftentimes descendants from liberation movements. And unfortunately, these people, once they are in power, become corrupt. And I don't know. So they are erecting a system that was not intended to erect or that does not um, represent a true democratic um, leadership. So what are the reasons for that? Does power make or power make corrupt? Is it a colonial legacy? I'm still listening. Look, I think, um, you know, I would say that we have to sort that out. In, in South Africa and other countries, I think it would be too simple to overlook the, you know, 400 years, for example, in South Africa of, you know, the dominance of the colonizer. Colonizer-colonized relations are not something that I think we could erase very, very quickly. And, and I'm going to say one of the things that students here found very interesting is that so many of the black consciousness ideologues, of course, cite Hegel. And so they ask me, well, you know, Steve Biko, um, Walter Rodney, um, Franz Fanon cites Hegel. Why, why, why are they citing this German philosopher? And I said, well, you know, we know that Hegel said all kinds of very offensive things about Africans, that we have no memory because we haven't mastered the art of speaking in European languages. At the same time, I think revolutionaries and, 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 and thinkers also um, are aware that Hegel's phenomenology of mind, I know that in Germany you sometimes use Geist, like spirit. Um, there's a very interesting and informed mapping of the master-slave relationship. So these are, these are complex, they are nuanced, they, they deal with, you know, ranging from questions of recognition 
of being human, of acknowledgement, of desire. I mean, the, the, the spectrum is incredibly wide and broad. And for those uh, of, of you who read Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized, I think that Europeans have to be very careful when they talk about African corruption. Very, very careful. Because you can't colonize Africa and, you know, massacre, maim, murder, exploit, extract, and then say, oh, look, they can't run themselves. I mean, these are the complexities of colonizer-colonized relationship because when you have 400 years in the context of South Africa of servitude, there is obviously going to be ways in which the colonized want to imitate the colonizer. In the same way that people involved in feminist movements will tell you, you know, how annoying it is when you have a woman who's siding, who's siding with the patriarch. You know? So, Rosina, Rosina Mart, you're saying we have to be careful how we act. But, of course, um, well, people from the political or scientific area need to respond. But, but wait a second. I, I would like to mention Axel Kabu, a sociologist from Cameroon. And 30 years ago, uh, she written a book, which is a discourse, and uh, a pamphlet, she called it, and uh, she warned her comrades only to make responsible the colonialists and their institutions. At the time, she turned to the Third World Movement and said, if you always only see external forces as the guilty part, then this will lead to a situation where those in power, our own people in power, are no longer made responsible. Because they then say, oh, we can't do it differently because the colonialists, this is what they taught us, or we are the victim of uh, the time of colonialization, and this is why we are the way we are. So that was the first point she mentioned. And the former president uh, of Germany, Köhler, during his office, he always um, had uh, forums far right on Africa with his colleagues. And then he always had a section with young um, uh, managers, African managers, and I remember that they said, and it was a young woman from Namibia, so we would say she was a bureaucrat, she, she worked in administration, and she said very clearly, and now quote her, I tell my mother and have been telling her for years that she should stop thinking that the colonizers were guilty because it takes, draws away all her energy to finally roll up the sleeve and change the world locally. And I was completely flabbergasted by her opinion. And I must say, to some extent, I also liked it or enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, wow, this is a young generation. And they say, get away with all that old rubbish. We are now doing it anew. We will start and we just stop with always lamenting. These were her words. And I must say, there's a new generation growing up, a new generation which takes her destiny, their destiny in their own hands. And in Sudan, you've seen it. I am really got the utmost respect of these young people, also journalists, journalists who stand for press freedom, so something is happening, not just on the economic field, but there are new startups also and technology, what you've been mentioning earlier on. So I think this is really encouraging and I really like it. And if such movements then ask for support, if they say, hey, could you help us in what we pursue, then I'm very willing to support but not me saying I need to support them. And to me, I, I would never get the idea of uh, pursuing such an approach. The Africa Stifting, the Foundation of Africa, doesn't have this mandate. That is, we don't have this attitude of support. This is not our mandate. Manfred Tins, what is your 
opinion on that, on this, well, complex topics, maybe from a, a law perspective. Well, I don't know whether it's a law perspective, but I have been following what uh, Ushi I just said. And I have a similar view on it, however, I think that there is a certain legacy, legacy a certain colonial legacy, and it's it's difficult to handle this legacy. Well, a lot of countries, maybe maybe all countries in Southern Africa, if you well have a look at the borders, the uh, they were founded um, by colonizers. The borders go across ethnic groups, ethnic lands. And I mean, and it's an ideology that keeps the country together. And it's, I mean, it's difficult in Namibia. Um, I started working there in 1990, the year of independence. So there was a huge, uh, well, spirit of liberation that was uh, flowing. It was really, you could really feel that spirit. And this spirit kept the people together, it influenced the people back then. And um, after 20 years in Namibia, if I remember the lectures I gave then, I talked to people who, I mean, did not really experience apartheid. Maybe they heard about, their parents talk about apartheid, but they themselves did not experience it. And so this spirit of liberation, I mean, they didn't really experience this spirit. To them, the spirit of liberation belonged to the past. And it's really difficult to bring in something new here. Of course, of course, Africa and African countries will only be able to shape a successful future if they come to terms with their um, present. But this process is really difficult. And unfortunately, um, this process in many African countries has not yet reached the success we um, are hoping for. So let me come back to Namibia one more time. The political constellation in Namibia is really interesting. The present um, president of Namibia belongs to a minority. He was elected for a second time. And after all that, well, I have witnessed here from a distance, here from Europe, by well, newspapers or news, etc. He seems to be rather successful in keeping the country on track, safeguarding democracy, the rule of law, etc. Um, I don't know whether this country can really formulate a recipe for other countries. I don't know. It's difficult because every single country needs to find its own way, its own path. But maybe this really is a positive example that can stimulate other countries. I think this process or this issue is a difficult one. And of course, we cannot say that things have to stay like they are. I mean, we have the legacy of the colonialism, but people need to take their fate into their own hands. Ms. Ayat, you you just said a very encouraging sentence. It gives us hope. Ms. Maad, what gives us hope? Hope for the African con continent today. OK. Um, I think just in terms of what um, um, Mr. Hines had said, and can you still hear me? Yes? OK. And and also Ms. Ms. Eight. Um, I think there is a young generation, obviously, who's not experiencing apartheid the way their parents did. And most young people can now go anywhere in South Africa. They can go to any school because you have the different forms. I mean, the legalized aspect of apartheid is no longer there at the same time. This is not to say that racism is still not alive and well. So we have to be mindful of that. For example, just th three or four years ago, we had the situation where a girl from at a school, at a previously white school, was actually told that she cannot wear her hair because the, the regulation for the school um, was sort of, you know, set up 
during the apartheid years and they told her her hair has to be at the back of her head. But her hair is curly and big and it, it, you know about this, right? And so students protested, you know? So, so on that level, there's all of that happening. And at the same time, there's also the question um, of, for example, younger people saying, you know, we want to live our life in freedom. My aunt is taking the South African government to court for land that is historically and, in, and, and part of our ancestral land. And she's very upset that I'm not interested and I'm not involved because I told her this will take forever, you know, and I don't want to spend my time like that. I don't want to spend my life like that. I have other things to do. But I just want to make a point very quickly about this whole idea that apartheid is, is, is no longer there because the structural and the systemic, you know, um, and, and the institutionalized aspects of racism, it doesn't disappear. You still have white settler colonials in South Africa that are riddled with entitlement. And that aspect of being a colonial doesn't, doesn't just go away. I think as much as um, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't hopeful and positive and determined to make sure that the time that I spend on this earth is spreading a message that comes from my pedagogy, from my education, and that is to teach young people the ability to think, to write, and to imagine on their own terms, and to question those colonial terms, but to spend our time thinking and producing knowledge that is new, that is different from what we've been taught, but also to question it, to say, you know, how did I come to write this paper or write this essay or, or think in this way? And so if, if we can start at least with that, certainly within the university context, to, 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 to foster this environment of, of, of challenging the way that we think, the way that we speak, the way that we construct knowledge, for me, that is the most important aspect of what I do. So I'm hopeful about that because I'm not gonna sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. We all have a contribution to make in this world and we have to start by where we're at. We're not here to tell other people how to behave, how to conduct themselves, how to take up their political practice. You know, part of being an adult in this world is recognizing your agency, your ability to transform the world you live in. You know, not just to pontificate. <laughs> So, education and learning from one's own history, right? Ms. Eid, at the very beginning you said that uh, you weren't happy with, um, well, the details of the new coalition agreement, but what about the practical, well, politics, pra practical moves? What would you encourage? Well, first and foremost, we in Germany have very little Africa competence. We know too little about Africa. We still have these old cliché images in our heads, and especially organizations that live from donations produce or uh, reproduce this image of Africa being poor and uh, being in hunger. And to a certain extent or at certain locations, this is true, but this is not the Africa of today. And this is why I'm happy if at the University of Bremen there are study courses, but this is not enough. We need far more scientific institutions, and I hope that a German African suit for applied sciences. We've got linguists, we've got ethnologists, uh, we've got sufficient of these, to be very honest, but we have too little scientists who look at the modern history of Africa so that we then become capable to advise politicians. And this based upon empirical knowledge and findings so that in politics one can then have realistic decisions which are heading towards the future. This is one point, and this is completely missing. And secondly, we have to ask ourselves how powers shift in the world. We have tectonic shifts 
We all know that China is the biggest cooperation partner in most African states. Russia is coming back, so they had withdrawn, but now they come back and they start to become active in the military field. Japan has a process called TCAP. India, the Turkish president, is again and again going to African states, and Africa doesn't need Germany. To be very honest and clear, the African states can choose with whom and which state they would like to co cooperate. And these tectonic shifts have to be considered in an external policy, which is always looking towards Africa. So this is the external part. Internal in Africa, there is a large middle class. Urbanization is continuing. A lot of young people have studied. When I studied in the 60s, we just had 20 African students at my university, but the numbers have been increasing so much. So many are studying, not only studying here, but in the United States, in China. So there's a pool of experts who want to roll up their sleeves in the country, but, and this is the problem, that very often there is a limit, there's a ceiling, that is young scientists, young people do not get a chance to get an appropriate job. That is, it's really very urgent to create corporations, that is medium-sized companies, and I'm not talking of large investments in Africa. No, we need cooperation partners that is small and medium-sized companies here and there, and those can create jobs and also having apprenticeship. Because in the United States, you need, oh, sorry, in Africa, you need so many jobs. If you don't want, if you want to prevent the youth of not living a life that's not worth living, allowing them to live. Well, when it comes to building all the um, the cities where the um, people should live, right, in the future in Africa, so these cities have not yet been built. Yes, also that, but this internal development and to have that in one's perspective and also looking at the external side and then to say we as a Federal Republic of Germany want to face this, we want to become active and wherever we are asked to do so, uh, this is where we would like to provide support. So this is the approach and that's an attitude. And here one is focusing too much on uh, development cooperation. I think this is a completely wrong track. Mr. Hinz, what do you expect or what do you expect uh, expectation, expectations of the um, next German government? Well, I have to admit I have not yet read those 170 pages of the coalition agreement. But what Mit Eis just said sounds, sounds very plausible to me. And from a more pro pragmatic um, point of view, maybe, and it refers to one of my action um, areas, I had hoped that this coalition agreement would consider something that is doesn't consider, if I'm informed correctly. And the West Sahara is not um, acknowledged. It is the Western Sahara is not considered. And it is important in the European context. It is very important. So Germany is kind of hiding away behind France, and it does not really have an own opinion, an own stand here. A few weeks ago, the European Union suffered some a severe failure because um, they had they received um, a verdict from Luxembourg talking about the trades and um, nulling the tra tra trade between the European Union and Morocco because they were um, not in line according to the law. So I had hoped 
to um, finally put an end to the last colony on the African continent. So you are personally committed here as well. And right, Ms. Mart, maybe some closing remarks from you. What do you expect from Germany? What do you expect um, from a German Africa policies? I think we've covered quite a lot today. Um, and there's always more to be said on this topic. It's not so much an expectation, but rather a kind of understanding that, you know, all forms of all forms of politics has to start with a recognition. I think you raised that, um, you know, not, not only about forgiveness, but to recognize the destruction that you've caused and the lives that were lost. I think the way forward is to is to start with the recognition and also to think about building ways in which the future of Germany should not rest on the oppression of other people. I mean, in order to learn how to be human, you have to recognize that your humanity does not depend on the oppression of other people. So that's 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 my message, my my closing remark. I mean, obviously. There's more to come, and we can stay here for many hours. But at the moment, I think we've all made a contribution to this discussion that leaves me with that. So I'm, I'm going to say that's my closing comment. Thank you. Well, I too think that we have had a very interesting, very exciting discussion today, and we learned that it's not about figures, about money, but it's really all about changing hearts and minds to reflect, to reflect on one's own past, how to deal with the past, and how to be able to change the future. So thank you all for participating. Mr. Hinz, there is a philosopher from Romania who um, is 105 five years old and he has 200, more than 200 followers on Facebook. So, so there are examples and um, I mean, we can live up to. So I would hope to see you in a few years discussing with us here as well. Ms. Eid, I think it was in 1986 I interviewed you and about the submarine deal with the apartheid state, and you were strongly against this deal. And today we really experience that you still are committed to the Africa cause and that you're committed to that continent and that you are still an important voice for Africa that still needs to be heard. Thank you very much. And Ms. Mart, I mean, you are embodying and connecting so much knowledge and uh, insight so the University of Bremen can be really proud to have you as a research ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And now, last but not least, I also wish to thank those um, two interpreters. I mean, their job was not that easy today, I'm sure. Ifatzan and Hela Wiedemann. Thank you very much also to the team of Radio Bremen and to the team from the University of Bremen. They have made it possible for us to gather here this evening. Thank you also to you, the audience, and thank you who, uh, who have listened online. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Goodbye.